Hello once again, ladies and gentlemen. Can we talk about Transformers? Ah, uh, yes. Here we are again. The Can We Talk About podcast. Talking once again about this big old podcasty thing. That thing that lends itself so well to this little particular area of podcasting, Kristen. You sound sarcastic. I, I, I mean, we talked about it in the preview episode thing where uh, bad 80s cartoons or things that are easy to make fun of that uh, aren't about a particular demographic mm-hmm. are, <laughs> are very much our wheelhouse. And quite frankly, Kristen, making fun of robots, uh, nobody's going to get offended by that, I don't think. No one gets hurt here. <laughs> they don't got feelings. Of course they don't. They have metal hearts. Or Cosmotrons? I'm referring to, of course, that series of Might and Metal that... Actual 80s cartoon classic, The Transformers. I am unaffected by acid rain. My name is Joe. I'm Starscream. Or am I Skywarp? I'm Kristen. And we are watching The Transformers Generation 1 via Tubi, where you can watch things like Sonic X. Oh, gotta go faster, 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 faster. Or an actually good movie like UHF. I've been meaning to rewatch that recently. Well, now now you can watch it with limited commercial interruption. Sounds great! And since you haven't been watching UHF, Kristen, have you been watching anything interesting of the various streaming platforms that we uh, now consume all of our media? (laughs) What I have been doing is helping breathe life into what will probably be one of the last major releases for the Nintendo 3DS, Persona Q2. (laughs) That came out this week. Uh, We are recording on June 8th. And last night I played it for six straight hours. God damn. Well, I know you do like yourself some Personas. I do. Um, and the only reason I bought this game is because the female main character from Persona 3 Portable is in it, and I love her. Yes, and that's... Uh, well documented. I don't want to say the word Stan, because that's weird, but uh, that's who... I you... call her on Twitter. I'm her number one fan. There this you go. Is fine. Perfect. That's there. She's that's a... simultaneously me and also my daughter? I don't know. It's a much less offensive term to use. I like it. Yes. You know, as someone who likes K-pop, I'm sick of the word Stan. <laughs> I have been playing uh, a fun little game, and I say a fun little game that I've had for probably two years at this point, uh, Mm. that I've put over 60 hours into called Earth Defense Force 4.1, The Shadow of New Despair, which is uh, a game that would- Sounds like we're both playing really monotonous games right now. A game that would gross you the fuck out, Kristen, because it's about giant bugs. (laughs) Yep, not a fan, so uh, I will not be playing that myself. Thank you for the anti-recommendation. This week we are looking into Divide and Conquer, which- follows our new main character, Kristen, super genius, not robot, honorary Autobot, uh, who is perfect in every way, Chip Otacon Chase. <laughs> Joe, I'm a fan of Chip. He's better than Spike, I'll He's say. He's a sexy little nerd. <laughs> and he doesn't wear a hard hat. Yeah, he, his head's strong because he's a big brain in there. Oh, and we also got some robot asshole who lays on a bed for the entire episode, fucking lazy bone. <laughs> Why can't he just... Stop being hurt. Anyway, we will return to the Chip Chase Show after the theme song. The Transformers, more than meets the eye. Autobots wage their battle to destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons. The Transformers, robots in disguise. The Transformers, and now back to Jim. Okay, that kind of came out of nowhere. Joe, I have a request. Yes. I want you to sit here and listen to me while I name all the Decepticons for you, because I think oh. I have it. Oh, okay. All right. This so... occurred to me last night. I think I know all of their names now. Okay. Well, that's a good start. We are six episodes in. Yes. If you don't, I, I won't give you any hints. I won't give you the total number. If you don't mind just going for it, go for it. Okay. Got Megatron, who's a gun. Correct. Starscream, who's a jet. Correct. Thundercracker, who's a jet. Uh-huh. Skywarp, who's a jet. Right. Soundwave, who's a cassette player. Correct. Rumble, who's a cassette. <laughs> yes. Ravage, who's a cassette. Uh-huh. And Laserbeak, who's a cassette. And right. Reflector. There you go, baby. That's yeah! all of them. I am nowhere close at all to knowing what colors they are, and I don't know. I was thinking, like, oh, maybe I should do a check-in and see how I'm doing with the Autobots, too. There's no point. (laughs) I don't know any of them. So, Kristen, Divide and Conquer, written by Donald F. Gloot, whose major claim to fame happens to be that he wrote the novelization of The Empire Strikes Back. Um, I don't really have an opinion on that, but 
But thank you for the information. When we start off here, Kristen, it takes two seconds for us to get hard hat people. So I'm just going to assume that everyone in the Transformers version of Earth wears hard hats at all times. To all of their jobs. At all, which happens to be a weapons factory, as we find out. So when you're, I guess, you know, when you're producing weapons, you probably should have a hard hat on. I, I It's not the thing that makes the least sense to me in this episode, so... <laughs> That's fine, I guess. Um, suddenly there's a narrator coming in out of nowhere. Yeah, we gotta, again, kind of, it's a show about robots. We kind of got to tell the kids what's going on. The Autobots wage their battle to destroy. Not enough anymore. Mm-hmm. We, nope. we gotta go, all right, so humans are now joining the fight. Yeah, okay. And they're making weapons to fight the Decepticons. And there's a nice big propaganda poster of Megatron with the enemy plastered across it. I'd like that for my bedroom. Um, I'm pretty grateful because i feel like as they were ramping up to be like the ultimate enemy i was like oh no is this gonna get political (laughs) humans (gasps) wait (laughs) chip is here Kristen, and he has been recruited into the war machine just like huey and atacon before and after him respectively yeah they got this really swell little 14 year old boy helping them create weapons he is here with dr lab coat who mm-hmm. is just like, you know, Chip, uh, we, uh, we'd love to get your eyes on this really quick here because uh, apparently with your computer knowledge, you could double the production of the weapons that were doing, just with a few keystrokes, too. Uh-huh. So this is crazy, and I feel like there's no point in even talking about it because we're never going to find a satisfactory answer to why. He goes, beep, boop, boop, and then suddenly there's like three cannons on the assembly line. Whoa, he did it! And he's just like, I hit the start button. Much like later in the episode, when he's just like, mm-hmm. why don't we use the fucking supercomputer that you guys have? What if we just boop? Humans and Autobots, Chip is Chip is attentive. That is his superpower. He's just like, why don't we just do this obvious thing when mm-hmm. everybody's got blinders on? Anyway, Kristen, the Jets are here. Yeah. But Benny is not. Oh, he's here. Where's my kitty? I have a cat named Benny. Named for the character played by Matthew Perry in Fallout New Vegas. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> He's black and white. <laughs> Much like Benny's checkered suit. Exactly. All he needs is a, a special 9mm pistol. I really hope he doesn't try and shoot me when I'm sleeping. So, Kristen, some hard hat men with guns show up. And by some hard hat men with guns, I mean there's an animation error where we see soldiers in one shot. And then mm-hmm. in the very next shot when they're shooting. It turns out they're actually oil rig workers. <laughs> As the jets fly through, again, for like the ninth episode in a row, uh, the, s- the, the side of a human building gets blown up where there's hard hat men. and he just crashed at the wall. The reason everyone's so mad about the Decepticons is all the property damage. <laughs> Chip doesn't seem too phased by this, by the way. As the jets all come in and start blowing shit up, he's just like, oh, Decepticons. Hmm. Well, crap. He, see, he didn't see Ravage because seeing Ravage would have made him have flashbacks to those cold metal jaws around his cute little neck <laughs> directly through the window mm-hmm. it, it was a whole thing so chris lada here sounds like he has a cold as he commands the decepticons <laughs> to steal energy and did starscream sound weird to you in this episode Kristen? um no but megatron sounded better is that weird Maybe you're getting used to that, but I feel like there were a few line reads where Chris Lada was like in and out in two seconds and he had to go record <laughs> Cobra Commander line. So it's like, all right, do your Starscream lines in the middle of this. Oh, fuck. Uh, all right. Blah, 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 Megatron. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go yell at Zartan. Goodbye. See you later. Yeah, I also think upon uh, listening again to this episode, you criticized my transcription of Megatron's laugh as <laughs> <laughs> and I still think I'm right. I the the jury's still out on that one. I gotta I gotta think about it. We'll convince you. So I'm getting some serious deja vu here, Kristen, uh, as yes. we are in a very blue mechanical area. As uh-huh. the Decepticons are kicking over turbines and shit, Soundwave is generating Energon Cube. Soundwave just shows up out of nowhere, by the way. He's just here because they need him to make the Energon Cubes, I guess. He didn't feel like crashing through the wall. He was a cassette. He could have been inside one of them. We don't know. That's true. But we have a problem here, Kristen, where I messaged you immediately after this happened, where I'm going to get a fucking aneurysm because... <laughs> And and you were correct in saying you don't know any better, so you just probably assume yep. this is something all of the Seekers would have as a power. So here's the thing. I did notice that the colors of the jets changed, like, 20 times. Um, I couldn't tell, like, how exactly it was wrong, but, like, between shots, it was clearly that they were colored, not the way that they were colored before. 
Um, and I don't know if I would have noticed if you didn't point it out. There was a thing, well, first of all, there was a thing where all of the jets each did their own thing. Like, uh, Starscream went, insects, as he fired at the humans. And then it cuts to mm-hmm. another jet colored like Starscream, who was clearly Thundercracker, as he just yes. firing another shit. Then it cuts to another jet colored like Starscream, who teleports! Uh-huh. Yep, that's when I noticed. I was like, um, pretty sure that's supposed to be Skywarp. <laughs> that is Skywarp's thing. And later on, when they leave, Skywarp teleports again. And he's colored like Thundercracker, and I want to die. I'm glad. It was more just funny to me than uh, existential torment. So Dr. Labcoat is not a cool customer like Chip here. He is worried, and he's basically ready to give himself up as a slave to Megatron. But Chip has his big computer brain to to push a few more buttons as... How does he do it, Joe? From the mouth of Chip himself. Just got a dink, dink, dink. Did it. What he did is he called 911. So we cut over to the Autobots here, back to uh, the Autobot base. Mm-hmm. Multiple characters refer to Optimus Prime by his full name in this episode, and it just sounds awkward. I noticed that too. For a little bit, I was thinking, do they always do this? And did I just not notice before? Or is everyone like just really formal? this episode early episode Kristen, and much like the autobots flying in the last episode i'm sure they'll grow out of it but many many people refer to optimus prime by his full name and it sounds like they're not friends exactly yes thank you (laughs) also wanted to note here as they're panning uh across all of the autobots bumblebee is a very short man he is not even tall enough to suck trailbreakers robo dick that's not how i would have put it but i did notice that he looked (laughs) extra teeny tiny Optimus is out with Spike, trying to get information on where the Decepticons might show up with the next space bridge. Because I guess it's random? I guess. Yeah, they just keep building new space bridges. I had a problem with this, too, because I was like, isn't the space bridge a physical structure? Uh, they're also okay. out, presumably out in the ravine from Transport to Oblivion, which has filled up over the last two episodes. Yeah, it's all great. Don't worry about it. One of the things that I love that happens multiple times in this episode, so Optimus is talking to the Autobots uh, on... A big screen in Teletran 1. Joe, who is filming Optimus? (laughs) (laughs) That's a wonderful question, Kristen. (laughs) I was like, okay, am I going to see, like, there's someone else out there and he's, like, talking directly into their eyes? Because, sure, I can believe that maybe they all have cameras in their fucking faces. But no, it's just him and Spike hanging out. Spike doesn't even have a handy cam. This might be the quintessential Cheek Commandos, the enemies can see what each other is doing episode. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit ridiculous. When they were doing the panning shot as well, when I noted Bumblebee's size, uh, I thought Spike was with the Autobots at the base. I did too. It turns out that it's Sparkplug, but he is looking very svelte, Sparkplug is in that <laughs> That's shot. That's exactly what I was going to say, looking svelte and fit. Mmm, <laughs> hot dad. So as Optimus is out at the, the ravine here, he suddenly starts getting a signal from Chip directly into his fucking brain about the Decepticons attacking the weapons base. So... <laughs> We have this really great transition (laughs) where Optimus is ready to mobilize and he says, Autobots, transform and meet me there. (laughs) What? (laughs) So awkward. Almost transform and roll out. Yeah, then Ironhide says, roll out. We're almost there, Kristen. I swear. At least someone's doing it. I swear they say it. I swear they do. It's going to be delicious when we finally get it. Sparkplug also uh, just goes, I'm never going to get used to that when they all transform for some reason, which I guess that's to tell you that, hey, the Autobots and humans are together, I guess. Ugh. Sure is strange, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Sparkplug has to say something, I guess. Back at the weapons base, the Decepticons make a big ol' super cube of Energon cubes, Woo. and Starscream calls Megatron to say that he did it alone. He's the hero. Guess what I did, Dad. The thing you told me to do and it went great. Aren't you going to praise me? So in the middle of um, Starscream begging for a nice job, he's like, ah, fuck, Autobots. (laughs) Optimus, when he arrives here, crashes directly. (laughs) Why did Optimus bring Spike with him, first of all? I have been wondering this basically since the first episode of why do they bring the flesh and blood humans to the robot fights? He's Optimus is like, stay back, Spike. And like, maybe all the way back outside <laughs> a good like mile away from the action how about you good. go back to your house that would probably be yeah. helpful go to school but when optimus arrives here he crashes directly through the block of energon cubes which Kristen, we've seen before like a bunch of cardboard boxes in a low budget action movie <laughs> high impact on energon cubes will make them explode he doesn't care he's going 
and he wants to be exploded this episode. He's ready for it. He's uh, thirsty for it. Optimus has a fucking death wish in this he episode. Does. It's kind of hilarious. Spike also combat rolls out of Optimus when he's driving. <laughs> I bet he practices that all the time. He's got so many bruised shoulders. Mm-hmm. He started with Bumblebee because he was lower to the ground and went a little bit slower. Doing it out of the big tractor trailer the first time, he was like, Ow! <laughs> Uh, but Ratchet or Wheeljack probably fixed. They probably gave him a robot shoulder. I thought you were going to say another sexy back massage. <laughs> Crystal, when Optimus transforms here, his trailer literally voips out of existence. Yep. Yep. And Megatron has to point out to Starscream and the other jets that they outnumber Optimus. So as soon as that happens, Get Starsc- him. Starscream's like, oh yeah, you're right. And they all blast him directly into a fucking wall. And he kind of gets his shit cleaned up. I, I've written the note of X eat shit a lot in these episodes for when somebody gets beaten up. And Optimus, none more shit is eaten, Kristen. Yeah, I like the way you have it phrased in your notes. Things start getting out of hand quickly. <laughs> because, so Thundercracker shoots some missiles. Mm-hmm. Skywarp shoots a missile, which... All indoors. All indoors. All within three feet of each other. Uh-huh. Uh, which Chip has the wherewithal to go, Optimus, watch out. That's a heat-seeking missile. So I guess that answers our question about whether or not the Transformers are warm. <laughs> I Once again, I don't agree with it, but okay. They Apparently there's a laser core in there, so that's probably pretty hot. Sure. I don't know if I believe that they are hotter than people. Optimus then deflects the heat-seeking missile with his forearm, which... I don't think that's how that works. And then gets tackled by Starscream, which has his gun dropped. Mm-hmm. And this fucking Rube Goldberg machine sequence ends with... Optimus's gun hitting the ground and somehow that being enough to make it fire into the wall behind Chip and Dr. Lab Which is a computer? Which is a computer. Which is going to explode. Which is now going to explode. And rather than... Opt- when Optimus says, I will shield you, because that is what mm-hmm. he he does here. He says, I will shield you. And he steps directly in front of the computer using his he body. It. Rather than, Kristen, instead of... He, he jumps Picking on... Picking them the- up and leaving? Yes. <laughs> Correct. And then the jets all <laughs> blast the motherfucker out of the ground, and they're just like shooting him in the chest while he's on the floor. <laughs> it's really it's savage. Spike also tries to pick up Optimus's gun, which gives him an idea for later in the episode. But apparently, Optimus's gun is much heavier than Jazz's. Yeah, so it's jarring no matter how many times I see it. The Autobots are all on their way here, so the jets all scramble to pick up as many Energon cubes as they can, and. Uh, the jets all just fly over the Autobots as they arrive. Yep, and uh, the Autobots briefly think, wait a minute, what's going on over there? But they're like, wait, Optimus is like in ten pieces right now. <laughs> we should probably see how he's doing. And Genius Bumblebee is like, Optimus, what happened? When he's very nearly a I fucking... I exploded! <laughs> very nearly a fucking smoldering crater. <laughs> what do you think happened? He got shot by three jets. Optimus then asks Wheeljack to repair him, but Wheeljack answers, not here. Like, it's a very personal and intimate thing. So they make him transform. There's a transition. Wah, 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 wah. And Optimus transforms and they leave. (laughs) Joe, you remember how I had an issue in the first episode with them doing a transition when they didn't need to? Transitions to two seconds later, yes. This is is egregious. (laughs) But they're all, all driving off. I guess Optimus is too big to fit in anyone's ass, so it has to be this way. And he's just kind of rolling along the desert going, (laughs) Optimus has a problem for basically the rest of the episode here where he talks so slowly, which obviously indicates that he's hurt. Yep. I mean, he is a robot, so it's not like he has to save oxygen. Or Solid Snake. (laughs) Stop it, Joe. (laughs) The Autobots all drive off here. Chip and Spike are concerned about Optimus, but uh, Bumblebee remains an Optimus about Optimus. Wait, fuck. (laughs) I like how that sounded. (laughs) How does it feel to do that joke, Joe? (laughs) Feels good that I got it off. Uh I'm I'm an Optimist about it. Yeah, you gotta get it off your chest and then you don't have to worry about it again. (laughs) Woo! So the Jets arrive, um, and apparently they got, like, all the cubes. They (laughs) get plunged into the ocean. I love the ocean base so much, Joe. <laughs> Every time I see it, I'm like, what a masterpiece. 
<laughs> it's a wonderful place for bad guys to be, but also... A very stupid place for robots to be? <laughs> yes. 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 I agree. <laughs> exactly. That's why I love it so much. Megatron asks about Optimus's condition, and Starscream says he's been permanently deactivated. Megatron's like, did you check the body? Did you do the double tap? And no, he didn't. So I don't even understand this next note. So Megatron mentions a laser core. If his laser core is extinguished, he will die. Now, Krista, we have talked a little bit about Sparks as... Oh, right! As basically the soul or lifeblood of a Transformer... So my note was, if you just replace laser core with spark, it basically makes sense. Okay, it really sucks that we have to use retroactive lore. However, I did look up on make sense. I did look up on the Transformers wiki. Laser core is mentioned a few more times. <laughs> not not in the series necessarily. There is one in like a package bio for a Megatron toy, and mm. one for uh, something a little later to where it's speculated that a laser core is an encasing around the spark. But sure. we're getting into fanon. Okay. We're getting into fanon at this point, so. Mm-hmm. Megatron says, Soundway, give me laser beak. And then he lifts up his arm and holds laser beak on it like he's a hunting uh, hawk or something. <laughs> he's a falconer. Yeah. And so, Kristen, apparently, because again, early in the series, things like that, when Megatron orders laser beak to go spy on the Autobots, laser beak's kind of like, mm, I don't know about that, dude. Apparently, I didn't get that from his reaction, but Megatron says, Oh, you nervous? You'll be more nervous if I fucking eat you whole right here. <laughs> uh, in Laserbeak's original character bio, apparently he's a coward, so. That's adorable. <laughs> I think Laserbeak and Ravage are amazing. I don't know if that shows up anymore, but I'd like to think that Laserbeak being kind of like, Oh, cool, cool. I'm scared. <laughs> We're on a different planet. <laughs> Go by yourself. So, Laserbeak is sent over to the Autobot base, which is, of course, about, you know, 20 feet away, half a mile. Yep. They're right across the street from each other. <laughs> Flies directly into the top of the volcano where the Ark is, and just lands on Braun's shoulder. Transforms to a cassette, lands on Braun's shoulder, which Braun <laughs> just did not hear at all, and... Infiltration success! A fucking weapons and equipment OSP turns himself <laughs> back into a bird when they get into the base proper, the main part of the base, because I guess Braun was just walking in with... I don't even remember who it was. Braun doesn't even say anything, I don't think. I don't know who Braun is, so... <laughs> Kristen, if it's so easy for Laserbeak to get into the base, why don't they send him with a fucking bomb? I mean, they sent him with uh, some laser eyes. And that goes okay. But let's get rid of everyone at once. Ratchet and Wheeljack are working on Optimus, who continues to talk. One or two words at a time. I don't know why they don't tell him to shut up. Huffer, for the rest of the episode, I say here, but for basically the entire episode, oh, that's he's like, who oh, that guy is. Oh, Optimus is doomed. I can feel it in my data bank. So he's annoying. Um, Spike says, nuts to that. Which is a very 80s thing to say. It is. It, very I don't 70s know. thing to say. I'm going to start saying shit like that, because Joe, I, I already say stuff like, what's his nuts all the time. <laughs> so, Kristen, whenever you're in a situation that you don't like, just say, nuts to that. I will start doing that, and I'll see how quickly all of my friends abandon me. Megatron orders Laserbeak to attack, and nobody notices... The nope. flying fucking robot bird until its laser eyes are carving up Optimus's chest. I think very briefly, either Wheeljack or Ratchet is like, what? Like, oh my god, a bat! <laughs> ah! And segment one ends with Optimus exploding. Woo! Kristen, it, it's, a, it's overkill. I'll say it. It's <laughs> overkill how injured Optimus gets in this episode. It's really funny, and he stays in one piece the entire time. Like... This makes me really kind of reconsider how impactful the movie was where Optimus actually dies. Yes. Because this seems nuts. So like with this, I feel like this is kind of jumping the gun on it, basically. How is it supposed to be impactful when I've already seen Optimus explode? That's that's partial problem. Like with me only having the re- frame of reference of the movie where characters die by getting shot by Megatron's cannon once in the shoulder. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> They seem indestructible in the cartoon. A little bit. A little bit. Uh-huh. So I guess that's how it's shocking. I don't know. It was an interesting choice for a cartoon for children. Segment two starts here. Optimus is still on fire and still talking mm-hmm. slowly. They're um in an, a base that is completely enclosed, <laughs> but all the smoke just goes away. So great. No, Kristen, the volcano top, it obviously just goes out through there. Yeah, because it's empty. Ratchet learns that he needs to replace Optimus's Cosmotron so he can go to the carnival or he'll die. So, Joe. Yes. 
What's a Cosmotron? The Cosmotron is the carnival ride where you get in and it can be either enclosed or open. I don't quite remember, but it's the thing where you're up against the wall and it spins really fucking fast. So, yes, it is. You know, so you're basically uh, using centrifugal force, I guess, to be mashed mm-hmm. against the fucking wall. To get your brain all pushed up against the back of your skull. Now, I don't remember if the Cosmotron was specifically called that at the carnival, but there is a ride at Knobles called the Cosmotron that is that. That's different. That's a Rock and Roll Express. Oh, okay. Now, Kristen, I could not remember the name of the Rock and Roll Express, which, mm-hmm. if you don't mind explaining the Rock and Roll Express, because now I know that it's correct. The Rock and Roll Express is a tiny roller coaster that is on a track that is kind of unlevel with itself, and it plays music depending on the theme of wherever you are, sometimes like 50s rock and roll and sometimes modern music. Um, and it goes forwards, and then it goes backwards. And depending on the theme park that you're at, it is a puke machine. <laughs> so is the Cosmotron. So, Krista, Will Jack happens to have a Cosmotron, but it's not here. And Bumblebee turns into a car, and he says, Let me at him, let me at him, just tell me where to go. <laughs> I wrote that he turns into Joe Pesci and Scrappy-Doo mixed together. Yep, he gets super psyched about it, but Will Jack is like, Bury the lead on that one. It's in my workshop on Cybertron. And the Decepticons put a cyber lock on the door. They put the fucking club on the door so they can't get in. How does he know that? And it's also been four million years since that happened, apparently. That's true. How does he know someone didn't mosey on in there and pick it up and eat it? Huffer continues being a sad sack here, but Ironhide shuts him up. And he, he also... hand on his face. He also volunteers Chip. He's just like, hey, uh, Chip might know how to fucking do a space lock. Do you want to go to Cybertron, Chip? Chip, can you breathe in space? You know what? It actually doesn't matter. Let's just go. Does, Krista, did Chip end up going to Cybertron before Spike? Yes. <laughs> How really jealous is? do you think Spike is? He really is the main character. He's so much better, Joe. We transition to the Decepticons here, and Megatron is all happy. He's like, oh, the Autobots, completely powerless with their glorious leader, Optimus Prime. He's pretty much right. <laughs> they really fall apart later. And Starscream, obviously, says... We should attack now, Megatron. How about that? How about we uh, go in there and push this shit in? And Megatron goes, nah. (laughs) I don't feel like it right now. Yeah, he doesn't really give a response beyond, I'm the leader, fuck you. No, so he just decides to dial up Shockwave to talk to him. And Kristen, in 72 billion astro seconds. So what's the conversion on this, Joe? With a B, uh, over 2,000 years. They're playing so fast and loose with these astroseconds. Astroseconds must be a very, very small measure of time, Kristen. <laughs> like, Aunt Joe, if it took two years, that would be fucking crazy. <laughs> I think that Shockwave even saying 72 billion astroseconds is probably at the very least one million astroseconds. I don't know. A million to a billion is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. I know. <laughs> Especially 72 of them. <laughs> so... Shockwave is going to send Megatron the coordinates of where the space bridge is going to open. But by coordinates, he means, here's a picture of the forest floor. <laughs> yeah, when and we Megatron's get... like, got it! And when we get there, uh, when the space bridge, I guess, is they just either build it there? I don't know what... It's just there! Know. It's just there. They don't explain it. We go back to the Autobots. Someone's like, Chipper, are you sure you'll be able to find anything? Even Optimus couldn't find where the space bridge would be. Well, Optimus didn't use Teletran 1. His own computer. I joke for a split second. I thought he was going to be like, Optimus didn't use the greatest tool that we have available to us. The internet. <laughs> My brain. Woo! So Spike calls Teletran here Sherlock Holmes with floppy disks because it can solve the fucking space bridge mystery. And yes, uh, there's absolutely no reason Optimus shouldn't have fucking used Teletran to find the goddamn space bridge. He wanted to be Detective Man himself. Turns out Teletran is the Sherlock Holmes and Optimus is the Watson. We went to the desert where Starscream, Rumble, and a bunch of reflectors are getting the space bridge ready. And Kristen, Starscream could not be more disappointed about his positioning here because, I mean... I, he thinks physical labor is below him. It's fine. I do too. I agree with him. He's he's leading the task force, which I just want to say, though, I think Starscream might be the only Decepticon who can do this because Megatron and Soundwave are too important. Mm-hmm. Thundercracker is lazy. Skywarp is a fucking dumbass. And uh-huh. the others are cassettes and they're, they should be the flunkies. You shouldn't have a flunky leading your operation. We get it done, though. I mean, it's this whole situation again where it's like, okay, now we, now we need a volunteer who wants to get in. Who wants to do it? There's a reflector here. 
who, yeah, they're cramming the, the Energon cubes into the, the, the transport vehicle from Transport to Oblivion, and I believe Rumble remarks, don't we need a drive for one of these things? Starscream just picks up that tiny reflector by the back of his head and just shoves him into the thing, and he's like, Argh! Happy trails! <laughs> I just imagine he screamed from inside the glass the entire time. <laughs> for some reason, the reflector has, like, a normal human voice to, like, no, no, not me, no. And reads Jimmy Stewart for some reason. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> we transition to Bumblebee, Chip, and some other Autobots. They found See, the you space. You don't even know who they are. I didn't name them at the time. It's Ironhide, Trailbreaker, and Blue Streak. Just so oh, you know. Stop showing off. I don't want to, Kristen. You tried to fake fan me there, and I don't want to say that I dunked on you, but <gasps> Kobe. So they find the space bridge. <laughs> oh, they don't even sneak over to the space bridge. They just walk on up like there it is. Yeah, because Starscream is just like, oh, there's some Autobots over there. We should probably do something about that. And it starts raining. And there's like a thing that happens. Okay, so I see if I understood this correctly. There's a lightning flash. Right. And one of the reflectors has a big old boob mirror. <laughs> Pretty much. And it reflects off of that. It's probably a lens. And it blinds the Autobots. Yes. Temporarily, I did. I did learn from reading on the Transformers wiki in the Japanese dub of this episode when Reflector does that, he goes flash beam. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Just like my Japanese animes. A, a lightning strike also happens, which nearly takes down Bumblebee because it knocks down a tree. Mm-hmm. Rumble gets some action in this episode a couple of places. He does his weird shoulder transforming. Bam, 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 bam. Some um, pile driving action. Yeah. Yeah, he creates a weird um, ravine. <laughs> a weird crater that Bumblebee just does a sick punch buggy jump over. Starscream is about to hit, I guess, all three of the Autobots at once with a tree. But... He just pulls it out of the ground. He forgets he has a gun <laughs> and missiles. And the stupidest thing ever happens where Megatron stops him, stops Starscream, and he goes, No, the rain has given me an idea. I have a much more convoluted and Saturday morning cartoon villain plot to do. What I thought was going to happen... Was Megatron was going to be like, Starscream, you idiot. Lightning is hitting trees all around you right now. <laughs> and I thought Starscream was going to get, like, hit by lightning or something. Nope. Let the Autobots win. Let them go to Cybertron. Let them take that flesh and blood human boy to space. Why? Well, no. <laughs> Megatron's just in for the drama. <laughs> Starscream gets to call him on it later. Starscream hesitates, of course, in this, and Ironhide freezes him with the fucking ni- liquid nitrogen, I guess. Is he the one that did the cold wind in the second episode? I just want them to be consistent, Joe. Is that asking too much? I mean, he has a glue gun in this episode, Kristen. I don't know if we'll ever oh, see no, that. Oh, no, that was him too? Ah. <laughs> uh. What a disappointment. The reflectors and rumble then all eat shit so the Autobots can get transported to... Si- this, this really, like... All this accomplished was not only did it help the Autobots, but it also uh, damaged the Decepticons. So you think, like, Rumble or one of the Reflectors would be like, Megatron, what the fuck? I got a laser mm-hmm. to the face just so you could do your stupid acid rain shit. Why couldn't they have, like, all pretended to fall down at least <laughs> instead of actually getting their asses kicked off purpose? Oh, no. Or, like, run away or something. Something like that. I don't know. Starscream is colored like Thundercracker, as Megatron tells them to return to base, so... No problem. The Autobots all get on the space bridge to Cybertron, and Kristen, this is the first time any Autobot is using a space bridge, first of all. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're not really scared like the Reflector was somehow. No, they are fearless. (laughs) They're like, we trust this works. And we get to Cybertron. Shockwave, as well, seems pretty well prepared, because when the door opens, they get transported to, you know, Shockwave's lab, basically, and he's on the defense he's ready he's not surprised at all he's just like autobots ah, i'm gonna kill you boom laser hand laser hand but they just fly and drive past him drive past him i think because they don't fly yeah ironhide uh uses some fucking first person shooter liquid nitrogen pack on the wall to <laughs> and it explodes to blow open a hole in the wall and as they're leaving he uses his his hands turn into a glue gun and he glues both the the human-voiced reflector and Shockwave to the floor. And uh, for some reason, Shockwave forgets that he has a gun hand and stops shooting at them. Yeah, it's totally fine. There are... Okay. More jets? (laughs) Kristen, not counting these jets, just so you know, before the end of the second season, we're going to have, like, 12 jets. That's too many jets. (laughs) Megatron gets on the horn here, some of his fluorescent jet... Pals, some fluorescent jets here. I like it. It sounds French. 
<laughs> Florescent. Florescent. Sounds like a Pokemon. It kind of does. Destroy all intruders with rain. Acid rain. I don't get it. Because <laughs> the jets go up into the sky and seem to shoot the sky. Yes. And then red rain happens. Which fucks with the clouds it, somehow. It looks like electric rain. <laughs> Which, that I would understand more than acid rain. So, Kristen, these characters here, just so you know, only appear in this episode, these these bright-ass jets. However, with 35 years of continuity to go off of, they all have names now, and at least one of oh. them has a toy. What are their names? The green one is Acid Storm. Makes sense. The other two are Ion Storm and Nova Storm, but I didn't check which one was which. I forget. Cool. I did have a toy of one of them, if you remember which one I had the toy of, Kristen. No, Joe, I don't remember <laughs> anything you have. I know you have a masterpiece, Optimus Prime, because you've mentioned it. <laughs> Acid Storm is the one that I had, the green one. I, you know what? I should have guessed that, because that's the only one that you knew by name and color. <laughs> And the masterpiece Starscream that they made, they made a green one to reflect this guy because, Kristen, if you didn't know, the Starscream mold, because it has so many different colors, they can release it for every fucking color variation ever and people will buy it. Yay! I would. (laughs) It's only a matter of time until I end up with the Starscream. If you don't remember that, you might not remember that I also had the masterpiece Starscream recolor that was Skywarp, so... No, I didn't remember that. Do you still have Starscream somewhere? I don't think so. Oh, not the. You should have gave, gave him to me. The second movie leader, Starscream. I don't think so. Yeah, the one that yells. I wish. Um, well, if you find him, let me know. So the Autobots arrive at Wheeljack's workshop here, and apparently Chip putting that big brain to use. There's uh, a transition, and there's just a big keypad with nothing on it. <laughs> and I mean a big keypad, like full hand-sized buttons, which I guess makes sense. Transformers are big. Transformers are large, yes. And at the very last minute, they were like, oh, Chip, come on, try, try. And he's like, this is the last thing I can think of. And then it opens. <laughs> so good on you, Chip. You tried. You're just very... One, 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 one. One, 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 two. <laughs> one, 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 three. Who knew, Kristen, it was nine, 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 nine. No, it was one, two, three, four. Ironhide may not have been the best person to send in on this fucking rescue mission because he calls the Cosmotron a Cosmo whatchamacallit. What a dumbass. I bet Ironhide's carnival goldfish only lasted two or three days. Ours lasted several years. And we had a second one that lasted two or three days. Yes, that one uh, did not go so great. But uh, they, they walk into the room and he just uses some weird spotlight eyes and there they are. And he just finds it. He just picks up the yeah, Cosmotron. Yeah, he's like, he goes, who was that fast enough for you? <laughs> So as they're leaving, the acid rain starts, as you mentioned, the jets, we see the cool jet design from the first episode that they turn into, because obviously they are not Uh normal human jets, and they fire into some clouds, which turn red, and there's some bright red rain here. It's a really, really bad animation. It's just literally an overlay of red lines that they kind of wiggle back and forth. Pretty much. Uh, Instead of transforming and roll-outing, all the Autobots decide to just run through it. So they're like, oh man, if that touches our circuits, we're gone. We're goners. We're done. But (laughs) if we don't get this back, so is Optimus. Trolley problem. End of segment two. The Autobots are all fucking dead as they run for about two seconds before they're like, they just start collapsing. (laughs) Why didn't they just put the Cosmotron onto Chip's lap and have him go? They could have gone back for them. I think it's fine. Segment three starts. They're all still dying. But yes, as you mentioned, Kristen, with this acid rain that seems to only affect robots, not only is Chip okay, his wheelchair is okay too. Like, shouldn't it have, like, rusted? Or... (laughs) Shouldn't his skin be, like, slightly itchy? So, Megatron has a camera directly pointed at the Autobots. And he's like, wah, 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 wah. That he can see just fine, by the way. When he tries calling Shockwave, it's all fucking fizzy. So I guess Shockwave's just in an area with bad reception. The Wi-Fi router is uh, over near where they are. <laughs> the one Wi-Fi router on Cybertron. Yeah, the only one. Megatron also at this point decides to just turn off, the, you know, does the <laughs> Austin Powers, close the door. We don't need to see it. He's dead. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. Turn TV off. And Starscream is like, all right, we have divided. Shall we go conquer? (laughs) And Megatron is just like Starscream for the first time in so long. (laughs) I agree with you. Let's go kick some ass. He like pats him on the shoulders like, good boy. Let's go. Back at the base, we reiterate that Optimus needs the Cosmotron or at the very least. Yes, we know. At the very least, the flying swings or the carnival will be a failure. 
Haha, uh, flying swings are great. Oh, and Optimus will die. Oh, yeah, that is... That's kind of a bummer. Back on Cybertron, Chip tries to rally the Autobots, but their circuitry is all... disabled. So, you warned me that there was a line in this episode uh-huh. that could perhaps kill me. <laughs> you are still of body, so it did I'm, not yes, kill you. Yes, thankfully everything's okay. I did send you a picture of the face I made when yes, this happened. Yes, Which was just wide eyes looking off into the distance. Chip, in his infinite hot wisdom, <laughs> says no one is really ever disabled as long as they have courage. Do you get it, Joe? Because he's in a wheelchair. They they did the 80s thing here where they were trying to be inclusive. We're just going to ignore your disability. <laughs> and it didn't work. No. So, wow. <laughs> uh, is this worse than anything in Gem? I don't know. I feel like just in general, them stealing from that museum in China was like <laughs> my really mind fucking Im- horrible. Yeah, my mind immediately went to Adventure in China. So Yeah. <laughs> That was a really huge problem. So the Autobots, through Chip's words, are all implored to reconsider, and... You're right, I can walk. Thanks, Cisco. <laughs> I didn't, didn't even watch this part because I was still like, <laughs> my brain would not focus. I just looked up and they were all getting out of there, and I was like, I guess they figured it out. Well, Kristen, if you remember, Trailbreaker uh, has a force field, and he decided at to just remember at that exact moment, <laughs> wait a fucking <sighs> second, I have a force field! No! Because, like, I didn't remember that Trailbreaker has a force field, Joe. But you know who should have remembered? (laughs) Trailbreaker! (laughs) He decides to slap that shit on, which, of course, will protect them from all the rain. And Blue Streak... He realized he had an umbrella (laughs) the whole time. Sorry, guys! So they all get under Trailbreaker's umbrella, Ella, Ella, A-A-A, as Blue Streak fires some fucking shoulder lasers, which he fires twice. And that mm-hmm. runs off the jets, the Rainmaker jets. No, don't hit us. <laughs> We're scared. <laughs> ah! And apparently Chip just lets us know, the audience, that the Autobots have like automatic repair shit inside them, uh, which let them Great. be fine. So then they transform. Chip says that he's going to transform and roll for his life. <laughs> I wish they would stop doing that. So Megatron's plan was basically death by a thousand cuts, I guess. I guess. If the acid rain is not powerful enough to make it so the Autobots can heal themselves as soon as they get out of it. He just wanted them to be tortured dead. (laughs) Uh, But luckily he turned the camera off so they could just leave. Kristen, is there breathable oxygen on Cybertron? (laughs) No. (laughs) No fucking way. I originally wrote, is there oxygen on Cybertron? But I was like, well, wait a minute. If there's rain, there would have to be. So that's why I put breathable oxygen. If there is nasty ass electric acid rain. (laughs) There should probably be oxygen, I assume. I'm not a weather cycle person. I think you need oxygen to make uh, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Mm -hmm. There's a whole um, gag in a musical called Starship that I like where the, one of the main characters takes off her space helmet, shakes her hair dramatically and goes, I have made it to this new planet. I will now check to see if the air is breathable. <laughs> it's a pretty good gag. So everyone transforms and we join Reflector and Shockwave just as they're getting the fucking gunk off their legs. And Shockwave got makes... got some peanut butter on the gum. Shockwave makes a pitiful attempt to stop them as they go stop just roll into the space bridge here yep no problems so they get back to earth real fast yeah they don't have to wait for the space bridge to generate they're just are Pew. is that a reckless use of energy possibly so now shockwave is double stranded on cybertron <laughs> We still gotta get to Optimus though to get him the Cosmotron how fast can you go Bumblebee what is it with Bumblebee and teeth? <laughs> Hold on to your teeth and all the skin on it, too. <laughs> Bumblebee is disgusting. He's a teeth pervert. And I hate him. Back at the base, Sparkplug... But Chip's got a pretty good smile, Joe. <laughs> Back at the base, Sparkplug is ready to give Spike that you're experiencing death for the first time speech, because... I-, I mentioned it before we started recording, Kristen. Spike acts like he's fucking eight years old in this episode at points. So clearly, at some point, what Sparkplug did when he should have had this talk with Spike the first time, is he told him that his dog ran away while he was at camp. When it turns out that his mother died. (laughs) Your mom ran away while you were at camp. (laughs) The Decepticons are on their way because Teletrans security alarm stops that whole uh, nice family speech because obviously Optimus is the new mother of the family. So Huffer still keeps saying, cool, we're all going to die. That's great. Spike gets mad. He hulks up here, and 
No, he, not today. He grabs a gun out of Jazz's hand. He carries it like a giant, like PVC pipe, like waddling. He's fucking Vulcan Raven or something. Yeah, and he's like, I'm, I'm gonna fight. If you guys don't want to, well, I guess I'm the whole army now. And even his dad's like, dude. It's actually probably more akin to Fortune's railgun. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Still heavy, either way. Still very heavy, yes. Spike's words here, he, he's ready to take on the entire Decepticon force, which inspires even Huffer, and all the other Autobots transform and roll for it. Except, of course... In that moment, Spike's courage manifests the matrix of leadership. And as you know, Kristen, when you have courage, you can't, you be, can't disabled. be disabled. <laughs> so, the Autobots... Whose courage was on the off switch, it was currently disabled. They right clicked and put enable courage, and. They're doing fantastic now. Joe, I cannot get the image in my, out of my mind of the Matrix of Leadership coming out of Spike's mouth. <laughs> and it's fairly large, too. It's so. huge! That's why it's hilarious to me. <laughs> Ratchet and Wheeljack will, of course, be staying behind because they gotta watch Optimus here. And we see all the autos. You guys go do it! <laughs> All the Autobots, it pans across them on the ridge here when the Decepticons What are they watching for to see if he slips away or if he suddenly sits up and is like, I'm fine? Krista, it's a very difficult medical procedure where as soon as they leave- They're stabilizing him? It's like all, yeah, it's like all the blood is going to come out of his chest. And Uh, they're playing a trauma center game there. They need four hands to plug up all the blood holes. They just gotta, yeah, put the palms flat on him. Like, he'll be fine. (laughs) We have to stay here though. So the Autobots are all out on a ridge here, and when the Decepticons arrive, Spike still has Jazz's gun, first of all, and he is the first person to fire. Uh Uh-huh. And the kick on it, Kristen, should probably rip his arm out of its socket. You know why it doesn't, Joe? It's a cartoon. No, because he has courage. Oh, courage and and a robot shoulder, as we have said earlier in the episode. So he's great. He's doing totally fine. Uh, Big robot fight. Yes, Uh, Return of Robot Fight in all capital letters here. Some highlights include uh, Ravage ejecting and tackling Spike, which finally makes him drop... so violent. (laughs) He does make a... (laughs) noise when it happens, so... Spills his ass all over the floor. (laughs) Rumble does some rumbling. We get... Shoulder transform. (laughs) Sideswipe using his jetpack, only to get fired out of midair by Megatron. What an asswipe. And, Kristen, a weird thing happens here, where... Starscream is like, we're expending too much energy. I mean, if you say so. Megatron is like, you know what? I'll finish it off myself then. And he transforms into gun mode, which makes me think that Starscream is just being lazy and he doesn't want to fire his null rays anymore. You do it. (laughs) I'm bored. (laughs) I want to shoot something. Get over here. Ravage gets called a bad kitty, of course. Ooh, only I'm allowed to say that. (laughs) Before he tackles Spike, but he gets scared off as Bumblebee arrives to flash in his high beams. He's not a bad kitty, he's a good kitty. Ravage is a good kitty. He is. Okay, so they get in with the Cosmetron. Yes. And Ravage just slam dunks it (laughs) into Prime. Just right in there, right under. He shoves it in the wrong way a few times. It's like when you're trying to put a USB stick in uh, backwards. You put it in the normal way, then you flip it around, must not have been right, and then you flip it around a third time. It's like, oh no, I was right the first time. I was just stupid. He just starts bashing it with his fist, like, get in there. When we come back to the battle here, (laughs) Starscream is just no longer with Megatron, expending energy like an asshole. He just dropped him somewhere, I guess. Flying and twirling around, shooting his lasers, and the Autobots are about to join in the fight, but... (laughs) Megatron says, I have won. Is there no one who can challenge me, the ruler of fucking everything? To which we get the very, very, very heroic fanfare entrance Optimus Prime coming in, being like, I challenge you, Megatron. (gasps) He's a very sexy thigh gap going on. (laughs) He looks great. This inspires the Autobots. It's our leader. It's Optimus Prime. And Starscream turns into fucking battle referee here as he's like, hey, Megatron, did you realize that Optimus just accepting your challenge means you are actually forced to face him one on one? It's Cybertronian law. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It sounds fake, but I love it. (laughs) Starscream just like, yeah, good luck with that. So, once again, we get a one-on-one confrontation with Megatron and Optimus. I'm bored of it. Megatron has been in a big fucking battle, and Optimus is as fresh as a daisy. So, (laughs) Megatron just goes... No, well, you 
probably shouldn't be. He shouldn't be, yes, but the, the way that they're playing it out, it's like Optimus is back at 100%. He just puts the Cosmotron back in and he's all good. Yep, he's fine. He wins the big Squirtle from the Dark game, and, <laughs> and he's like, I'm all cool now. And Megatron pukes. <laughs> Megatron He's puked. the carnival loser. He puked on the hang glider ride, so he has to go, no fair, I lose. No, someone help. Starscream's like. <laughs> Starscream puts on the smuggest face possible, mocking Megatron. Oh, you can't even beat Optimus Prime one-on-one? Well, I was able to beat him three-on-one, so I guess you're not a leader. <laughs> so Starscream, uh, he has a great time this episode. <laughs> Things really just go amazingly for him. It really does. He doesn't get shit on at all, basically, other a than... A mission goes well and he gets to watch Megatron eat shit. <laughs> uh, apparently the battle ends amicably after Optimus steps on Megatron's gun, which gets detached from his arm, and goes, mm. Do you yield, Megatron? And he's like, mm, Only for now. <laughs> Optimus could have killed him! Yeah, why didn't they kill him? They just... Yeah, all the Decepticons just leave. They're just gone! And they just go. Like, they are wanted because they keep murdering, or at least trying to murder people. On Earth, the planet that they've invaded. They don't try to take him prisoner or anything? They just no. let them leave. They shake hands after the ball game. <laughs> Starscream spits into his hand. <laughs> and Chip Chase goes, I guess that takes care of the Decepticons. Spike is like, hmm, well, optimist more like pessimist. <laughs> They'll be back. They'll be back. And Kristen, that's the end of Divide and Conquer, which was a weird name for the episode, because... Uh, it made sense. Uh, the, the, they tried to divide and conquer the Autobots. I guess? I have no problem with it. I always saw Divide and Conquer as, like, a there's two separate things going on, so let's split off into two groups and take care of it that way, and not the other way around if we're trying to take out I, pieces of the I thought it meant divide Autobots. the other people. Like, pick your battles and make them smaller to make them easier. Who knows? <laughs> It's pedantic. I did write in my notes here that it probably should have been something very Japanese, the name of the episode, like, Convoy in Danger. Get the secret part. (laughs) Our leader's in danger. Just add more sentences in there. And I did check, actually, the name of the episode in Japanese is SOS, Cybertron. Uh, fair. (laughs) So I got the exclamation point right. Who are they sending an SOS to on Cybertron? (laughs) Shockwave! Now is the point in the evening where we'll list off all of the fun contact things where you can reach us. Follow us on the Twitter machine at CWTAPod. You could follow me at Octopus, which is A W K T A P U S. You can follow me at Funny Girl TM, like trademark. You can find us on the iTunes. Is iTunes dead, Kristen, actually? Um, there's still going to be an Apple Podcast app. Okay. So we should be fine. So you can find us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, on the YouTube even. Leave a rating, give a review, do whatever you feel like. You can drop us a line, cwtapod at gmail.com, where you can tell us all about the ill effects of acid rain and what your favorite carnival ride is, unless it's that flimsy-ass zipper. That thing always looked like it was going to fall over. Never. Never in my life. That's why I never wrote it. Fuck that thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And we want to give a quick shout out too. Uh, after we posted our announcement episode, we got an email from Hoover, who was happy that we were coming back. And that means, Joe, what does that mean? Uh, our podcast is reaching outside of our circle of friends, our respective Whoa. circles of friends, which is yeah. pretty exciting. And Hoover did uh, email us on a few separate occasions, but I think it was after we finished with Jem. Yeah, so, it was after yeah. Jem. But <laughs> so uh, he's been there the whole hiatus, basically. So anyone else wants to get in touch? We'll give you a shout-out, too. Thank you for staying on. Hoover, you're a good guy. Uh Uh-huh. Next time, Kristen! Fire in the Sky, featuring a character with a very interesting history. That sounds foreboding. (laughs) It's been six episodes. We may as well introduce somebody new, because we... Kristen, we got to know characters like Braun and Mirage so well. (laughs) Oh, no, Joe, is it another robot? (laughs) If it was another human, I could deal with that. It's another robot. It's another robot! We can quiz me on the Autobots next time. For the Can We Talk About podcast, my name is Joe. I'm Kristen. And join us next time for more robots. More robots are in the mail!